test, test.
Good morning, everybody, and happy Mother's Day to all of our mamas here today. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in just a second, but first, a little drum roll, please. I'd like to introduce to you my granddaughter. Oh, golly, ain't she cute? <laughs> She's been with us since Tuesday, and she's not going home till next Wednesday. So Sue and I have been tag teaming. So if I sound a little hoarse and look a little haggard, you know I got grandpa-itis. <laughs> and, and I got to tell you something. I, I think there's something about a grandchild at least for this daddy, this grandpa, is more engaging than when I was a papa. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So I made the mistake this past week of trying to be all things to this little girl. So grandpa, 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 you know, I want to walk. I want to, I want to see the dog. I want to go outside. I want to pick flowers. I mean, on and on and on. And I was just run ragged. Until I realized, you know, part of loving this little cherub means setting some limits and some boundaries. Grandpa could only do just so much, and then he's exhausted, and he's not worth anything. And that's a good life lesson anyway, whether you're a grandpa or grandma, mom or dad, or you're just a, a loving, care-providing individual, and there are a lot of us like that here today. So that's Noel, and uh, pray for us this week, will you? We've got a few days yet to go before this whole wonderful uh, encounter ends. Moving right along, happy Mom's Day to everybody today. And I don't just mean the mamas gathered today, but everybody with caring, loving hearts, because, you know, there's a lot of ways to share God's love. Moving right along, today we will celebrate the Lord's Supper, and just a reminder to you that as you receive the bread, you may partake individually as, as you feel ready in that moment with God. And then when you receive the cup, we ask that you hold that, and the cup contains grape juice, so that we can partake together, symbolizing our unity as God's love family. Please fill me, says the bountiful basket, although right now it's about half full. Through uh, both April and May, we've been collecting food for Discovery Middle School for the after-school program, and we hope that uh, if you haven't already made a purchase of a non-perishable food item, you'll do that soon, because end of this month, I believe Julie and the mission team will be taking that on over to Discovery. So thank you for those efforts. Tomorrow, or next Sunday, I should say, please plan to uh, join us for the annual programmatic meeting. Just once a year, it usually doesn't last a long time, so grab yourself a cup of coffee and a treat, and we'll meet right here in the sanctuary. I'm, I'm going to be surprised to see who takes over the moderator's role. I know that may still be up in the air. Jane's kind of rolling her eyes and giving me the thumbs up. So, If you thought about that, now's the time to be praying about it, because we're getting close to the deadline. Usually, uh, the transition of leadership takes place at the May meeting of the church council, but uh, plenty of time yet to talk to Jane after the service. If God is kind of nudging you to consider that role, so important to the leadership of our church. And then moving finally on to uh, a moment for mission today, I'd like to invite Barb Brown to come forward to share with us a word about an offering today. So today or next Sunday, if you aren't prepared today, um, is the One Great Hour of Sharing offering, which is part of our Five for Five through the conference. There are envelopes. If you didn't get one when you came in, um, they are at the back table. And Julie or Kirk will get it to you. Um, they just look like this. Um, and if you, you know, you don't have to have it in an envelope either. But if you write it, um, if you're giving cash, you do want to put it in there. If you're writing a check, please notate O-G, whatever, O-G-H-S, <laughs> um, for one, one great, great hour, hour sharing. sharing, or one great hour would be fine, too. Um, I just want to share one little incident. Um, this offering goes to help people who are in really distressful kinds of situations. Um, so just here's one example of how the offering um, was helping someone. 
For 48-year-old Iraq War veteran Robert Z, buying a house was an important step toward recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder. So he had purchased a fixer-upper in um, South Carolina, and then the floods of October 2015 came. Days of incessant rain and wind caused a large tree to fall onto his roof. The damage opened the house to the continuing rainfall, soaking walls, floors, ceilings, and furniture. He did what he could, but it wasn't enough. And then he heard about the Disaster Recovery Support Initiative, which is part of, um, we go along with um, the Methodist and Disciples of Christ and some others to help with this fund. And volunteers from that organization were happy to assist as part of their work in modeling long-term recovery processes, and they connected with the emergency the emerging local long-term recovery organization, and they gutted his house and repaired the roof. Hmm. They installed brand new windows, walls, floor electricals, and plumbing. These are not just people talking, Robert said. They are really doing something. I am amazed that someone would do it for me. Generous giving to one great hour of sharing is enabling us to reach the most vulnerable families. It shows you are here. So, thank you. Thank you, Barb. Before we stand and take a moment to greet everyone this morning, um, I would like to just to do a quick... They've come all the way over from Bethany to take part in worship with us today, and we're so, so glad you're with us. If you haven't already signed in... Now clear your throat, because we have two birthday girls in our midst today. Uh, I want to sing happy birthday to Joanne Norling and Julie Jelm. So here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Joanne and Julie. Happy birthday to you. God bless you. For all who are able, please stand. Let's greet those around us. Let them know how good it is to be in worship here at First Congregational Church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'll invite you to be seated as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, and the choir shares with us their introit. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Please be seated. Come this day, Mother God. Come as an unfolding, nurturing presence. 
Come as steadfast love to hold us. Come, Mother God, come as an enabling, strengthening force. Come as tough love to let us go. Come, Mother God, come as friend and comforter, healing our wounds, walking our way. Come as wounded healer to make us whole again. Amen. Please join now in our responsive call to worship. Gaze into the heavens and see the glory of God. Lift up your eyes to behold the risen Christ. God is our rock of refuge and strong fortress. Christ leads us and guides us every day. Indeed, you have tasted the goodness of God, and we will know even greater goodness in the kingdom to come. We have come to find the way, the truth, and the life. We are here to ask and to receive. Here we accept the call to service. Will all who are able please rise? Christ is made the sure foundation, Christ the head and cornerstone, chosen of our God and precious, binding all the church in one. Holy Zion's help forever, and our confidence alone. And 15 and 16. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemy, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Shall be. 
The choir would like to dedicate our anthem this morning to all of the biological mothers among us, but also to all those who have served in the guise of a mother, to the youngsters among us, to friends, to family members, all who have offered love and care and concern to those in need. a few kids here today so if you guys would come on up and join me for a moment I'd sure appreciate your time Is it on? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming up here this morning. I appreciate it. Um, one of the things on Mother's Day that I always think about, and, and maybe you guys can help me out with this, is we have our moms. They're wonderful. We love our moms. But who are some of the other people in our lives that can be like a mom to us? You want me to start? Okay. My grandmother was like a mom to me. She loved me. She taught me how to look at the stars at night, how to pick rhubarb, did all kinds of fun stuff together. So grandmas can be like a mom. Um, my family friend, Rita Benz, she's kind of like a mother to me. One of my mom's friend, um, Emily, is also kind of like a mom to me. Pretty sure anybody, I don't even really think it has to be a female person, or it can be male, can take the place of a mom or a dad that they want to. A family doesn't mean to be by blood, it could be by, just like your family, like 
we're a lot of times in theater and it's like the theater family and everyone's your friend and like your family and just as long as you are open to everybody and you trust them and they that you will love each other you they, they can be your family Yeah, sometimes even our brothers can be like moms to us, huh? They love us and care for us when they're not picking on us, right? What's that? Than moms, huh? That's that's a, part, a little. Yeah. So on this Mom's Day, what are some of the wonderful things that moms do for us that we that we know that we're loved? Drive us everywhere. Make us food. Go back to school. And since you work long hours on schoolwork for us. <laughs> Give us hugs. Aww. Well, thank you guys. And, and in honor of all the moms out there today, that can be moms, dads, friends, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, I'd like to have you guys help me pass out some treats. So we have some kisses for everybody. So if you guys will each take a great big handful and pass those out to everybody, and there's plenty there. So, you know, if somebody wants more than one, they're welcome to have at it. So thank you guys, and God bless you.
come to a time of prayer. We'll begin with a silent prayer, have a pastoral prayer, and then the fall end with the Lord's Prayer using debts and debtors. Are there any joys or concerns that you would like to share with the congregation this day? <laughs> yes, Jane. Bless, bless all the moms. God bless all of the moms. Wonderful. And, you know, one thing for us to bear in mind, as Kirk pointed out just a few moments ago, is even Jesus was mindful of his mother right up to the point of his death. So moms are pretty special to us. Any other joys or concerns? Seeing none, let us enter into a time of silent prayer. We give thanks that Nancy has come home on Friday. We're very grateful for that. We're grateful that Scott is doing better and has his voice back. Today, Lord, we celebrate Mother's Day to those mothers in our community that gave life to a child. We celebrate with you. To those that have experienced loss, we grieve with you. To those that are like a mom to our children, we need you. To those that have experienced disappointment and heartache, we sit with you. Lord, we know that being a mom is hard and we have real warriors in our midst. We honor them. We also have many here today, including me, Lord, that pray Happy Mother's Day to our moms in heaven. Give them a hug for us, God. Gracious God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we thank you for the relationship that you made possible through Jesus Christ. In him you drew near to us, that in him we might draw near to you. We marvel at your patience with us. We thank you for your love. Before Jesus left his disciples, he promised that they would do greater works than he. And Paul and his colleagues at promise was fulfilled. Lord, they traveled unpaved roads and rough seas to proclaim the rule of Christ to the far corners of the earth. They were confronted by people who greeted them with suspicion, hostility, and even hatred. Yet they remained faithful. They had passion and compassion. We pray, O oh God, endow us with such passion such enthusiasm and devotion, the love and commitment with which you upside down for Jesus Christ. Great is your faithfulness, God. You are our rock and our fortress. For your name's sake, lead us and guide us and we, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The scripture reading from the lectionary text today comes to us from the book of John. In the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 14, we hear these familiar words about God's home. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going, Jesus said. Thomas responded by saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you really know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do not know him, and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this wonderful work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in his Son, you may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Here ends the reading of the Holy Scripture. May God add a blessing to the hearing, understanding, and living of the word this day. Well, you've all heard the old joke about the person who goes to heaven. Of course, they meet St. Peter at the pearly gates, and St. Peter asks, what denomination are you? The person says, Methodist. St. Peter looks down his long list and he says, you go to room 24, but be really quiet when you go by room 8. A bit later, another person arrives at the pearly gates of heaven. Denomination? Episcopalian, they say. Peter says, please go to room 19, but be really quiet as you go by room number 8. A third person arrives at the pearly gates. Denomination, asks St. Peter. Presbyterian. You go to room 11. But be really quiet when you go by that room number eight. The person says, I can understand there being different rooms for different denominations and faiths, but why do I have to be quiet when I go by room number eight? Well, says Peter, the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans are in that room, and they think they're the only ones up here. <laughs> Synod Lutherans in the audience today. I could have said UC Sears, but I didn't. <laughs> Jesus says to his loved disciples in verse 2 of today's text, in my Father's house are many rooms, and I've been fixating on that image all week. Hopefully Jesus isn't saying that there needs to be so many rooms in God's house because he has to divide us up and send us to our own rooms just to keep from squabbling. But sometimes I do wonder. I've often used this particular gospel reading from John in funeral services, and perhaps you've heard it. But as far as I can recall, this is the first time that I've had the opportunity to use it as a basis for a Sunday sermon. I'm kind of itching to, to get at this text. So, so let's explore this familiar text today and glean what we can for our lives and our call as Christ's disciples today. First off, I have to admit that I've always liked this text because it, it suggests that God's boundless love and grace is not only expressed in the gift of his loved son to us here and now, but also 
in the magnitude of God's heavenly generosity in the promised kingdom to come. Many rooms calls to mind one of those enormous and exotic vacation spas you see advertised on TV commercials. Beautiful, spacious, well-lit poolside accommodations. Room enough for everybody. And if you run out of room at this place, no problem. There's another condo just a couple minutes down the beach. Getting back to the text, though, what what exactly is Jesus saying to his loved disciples with his reference to many rooms? Well, if we hold Jesus' words about rooms in tension with the rest of today's text, we learn that Jesus is attempting to console his disciples who are deeply troubled by the idea of being separated from him. To, su- to do so, Jesus paints this this beautiful, wondrous picture of the enormity of God's home. It's the one image that they surely would have understood from their day and age. What you may not know is that Jesus, in Jesus' day, as in ours, there were businessmen, almost always landowners back then, who could well afford a great, big, beautiful home for their families. And as the family grew... As daughters were given in marriage, who then had children of their own, it was not uncommon that the loving father would simply build another wing right onto the already sprawling mansion, so that everyone, daughters, son-in-law, mother-in-law, all those beautiful grandkids, and everyone else connected to the family would have a safe and nurturing place to live. That was the custom. That was the way back then. Yes, Jesus is saying to his loved disciples, don't you worry about a thing. Even when I am gone, you will each still be a part of God's love family. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You will always have a place in God's enormous home. Always having a place in God's home reminds me of our wonderful motto in the United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are along life's journey, you are what? Welcome here. You're right. Always welcome here. That's the gift we offer everyone who comes through those doors. A pastor was talking to a group of young children about the importance of being good and going to heaven. At the end of his talk, he asked, where do we all want to go? A little girl said, heaven, heaven. And what do we have to do to be there? Dead, says the little boy. (laughs) Interestingly, Jesus is not just talking about the future heavenly rewards in today's text. You may have missed that. What he wanted his disciples then and for us today to understand is that the entire universe is the dwelling place of his Father. Which is to say, whether on this earth or in the heavenly realm, we are always held close in God's habitation. To put it a little bit differently, Jesus was using non-scientific language to metaphorically express a greater truth about the enormous scope of God's love and embrace. In this day and age, as we are just beginning to scratch the surface of truth, just beginning to understand the depth and the breadth of the created universe. String theorists and quantum physicists tell us that our our vast universe is just one of ten different dimensions of being, all impinging upon themselves in some cosmic scheme we can barely begin to fathom. So if Jesus were speaking to us today about God's house, in my Father's vast dominion are many dimensions, he might say, more than you can possibly humanly fathom. Yes, it is that vast abode of God that we speak of mansions, rooms, the earth and our solar system and the universe that we have not even seen the boundaries with with our best space telescopes 
that tell us that it's immense, it's enormous, it's amazing. Whether here or there or anywhere, sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. I got too much of that going on this week. We will always be under the roof of God's home, protected and safe in the limitless abode of God's inclusive love. That's a comforting thought, no matter where you live in time. Joys of the past two weeks, something I'll never forget, was the LGBT Allies event that our church hosted. I saw a transformation take place that night from the time our guests arrived, about 35 in all, from the time we departed. Initially, most were cautious. And if you look closely on their faces, you could see even a little bit of fear. And why not? The church, ironically, has been one of the most vocal voices against LGBT folks. The church has been one of the least welcoming places. The church has been the one place where God's acceptance has not been preached to that group of people. The church has many times used an old bait-and-switch technique, get the LGBTs through the door, and then aggressively and disrespectfully pray the gay away. But it was different this time. Sean Olson, Kay Olson's love son, did a fantastic job explaining the politics of our day and age. The Inclusion Network, Network was bold about their work to expand our diversity footprint in the community of Alexandria. Mark Blakesley, a son of our own church, shared about our denomination, the United Church of Christ, and its historic efforts to educate and change the discriminatory laws and to build bridges to a more just and righteous world. We did all we could to create what I would say was a safe and welcoming environment, that which we are known for as a church. That's our brand, that's our trademark, that which we do for all of our guests, whoever walks through those doors on Christmas Day or at the salad luncheon or in just a few weeks at our pancake breakfast. That's our identity. And at the end of the evening, we asked a simple question, and it was a little bit with fear and intrepidation that we did so on our part. Would you like to meet again to continue this conversation? And you know what? The fear was gone. There were smiles on everybody's face. There was a, an eruption of raised their hand enthusiastically in the room that evening. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. My Father's house, which is beautiful and welcoming and safe, has many rooms, many rooms. Every one of us here today shares something in common, whether you realize it or not. Every one of us here today has just a few very basic human needs. Beyond food and water, we all have a need for a home, a place to receive love, a place to give love, a place where we are accepted completely for who we are, created in the same wonderful image of our loving Creator God, that place may only be a space between two people. It may only be a room. It may be this church. And someday, I pray, it will be the community of Alexandria in its entirety. And on another day, in a future God is already fashioning with our help, I have no doubt that safe and welcoming place will be the way we define our world. Amen.
How do we define a, a safe place? We do so by love, unconditional love and welcoming. At this table, we have each been invited. And it doesn't matter if you don't quite understand fully about the grace of God or theologically you still have some doubts or questions or if somehow those doubts and questions have eroded away your sense of God's love, it, it doesn't matter. That invitation to this table, this holy place with Jesus Christ is still intact. It's still real. It's still authentic. And it can still transform our hearts and minds to become the people that God has called us to be. And so we remember today. And on that night when Jesus was betrayed, he was with his brothers in the upper room. And they took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. And in a similar way, the gospel writers record that Jesus took the fruit of the vine and having blessed it, he poured it out saying, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. And then he added these words. For as often as you eat at my table, partake of my body and blood, do so in remembrance of me and my love for you. Come now, the invitation has been extended, the table has been spread. Come and see how good our Lord is.
This is the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Drink in that love. Taste and see how good our Lord is. Praise is yours, O oh God. You bring us to this table as sisters and brothers. Lead us now through each of our moments to that glorious day when all your children will gather as family. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our peace made flesh. Amen. Amen. There are moments when the heavens seem to open to us and we sense the vast possibilities for life that God offers. We long to reach our God-given potential and to offer that same opportunity to others. The tithes and offerings we bring today are devoted to that very purpose. Will the ushers please come forward? join now in our unison prayer of dedication. We commit ourselves to you, gracious God, as we dedicate material gifts that represent our labor. When we ponder the amazing wonder of life, we are filled with awe. When we consider the gift of eternal life, we are humbled. When we remember Jesus as a cornerstone of the spiritual home, you are seeking to build in our midst, then we are eager to help. Let your face shine on us and on this offering, that your universal love for all people may be the truth that eliminates our world. Amen.
want to remind the members of the Capital Fund Campaign Committee that we'll be meeting right after church this morning. And also, I want to extend a, a heartfelt invitation to everyone to join us for a time of fellowship on the first level as you came into the church today. Uh, whatever there is to eat is immaterial compared to the fellowship and the joy of our gathering together. And everyone is welcome. Let's join now in the closing benediction. I will begin. Jesus sends us out into the paths of service. Believe it or not, we are being summoned to greater works than even Jesus did. How is it possible for us to do more than Jesus did? Can we preach and pray and heal as he did? We are chosen as Christ's representatives. We are the church, the body of Christ expressing God's love on this earth. Together, Together we, we can, can make, make a difference. difference. God is at work in us to heal our world. Christ has gone ahead to prepare a place for us. Following in Christ's ways, we can know the fullness of life. We believe God dwells in all people. God's mighty love is revealed through us all. Amen.